911, what's your emergency? Yeah, is this the office connected in any way to the hospital? Our personnel work out of that hospital, yes, ma'am. Are you in need of an ambulance? I can't afford one, to be honest. I think we'll be fine, but I need some help. How can we assist tonight? How familiar are you with organ transplants? I'm sorry, I think I misheard you. Did you say you want to transplant an organ? Well, it's, it's not my organ, it's my husband's. I'm trying to figure out which one would be the least painful to remove. I gave him a choice, but he hasn't been very cooperative. Let's take a step back. Can you tell me your name? So you can pull up my public record and have an ambulance fly here in no time? Sorry, sweetie, I fell for that trick last time. Thomas was irate for three weeks when he woke up. Thank goodness he didn't have the guts to tell the EMS the truth. Thomas, is that your partner? My husband, he's a prick, a cheating clown who doesn't realize I caught him with that little skirt at the local pub a few nights ago. Ma'am, are you intending to do harm to your husband? No, of course not. That little skirt did something that gave him food poisoning. Serves him right, karma and all. But honestly, I hate to see him suffer, so I told him I could remove his intestines. But he claimed I should call 911 and make sure that was okay. Is your husband conscious at the moment, then? Are you asking if he's alive? Of course he is, you idiot. Why would I call to ask advice on performing surgery on a corpse? Are you mad? Ma'am, I wouldn't advise you to attempt to perform any type of serious medical operation in your home. The complications alone could kill him, and you could be considered a murderer. Well, that's where you come in, ain't it, sweetheart? I wouldn't want you to be an accomplice to anything. If you provided your home address, I could see to it that EMS arrives there shortly, and they can get your husband the proper care. You weren't listening before, were you? I told you that I can't afford the trip to the hospital. Besides, I've done this kind of thing before, and Thomas was fine. You've performed surgery on your husband before. I tried to. Unfortunately, Thomas rattled off our address before I could finish. It was very disappointing. It can't be that hard, though. Have you ever had a surgery like this yourself? I can tell you about that another time. What I need to know right now is if my husband will bleed out if I drill a hole in his stomach. Did I just hear a power drill turn on? You did. I have to make sure it's working so there's no mistakes. There are a lot of organs in that part of the body. Using a crude tool could do more harm than good. Are you a professional doctor? No, but... I called the hospital. I want to speak to a surgeon who can walk me through this. I'm afraid there's no one here who would do that. Our primary goal is to make sure you don't harm your husband, and we wouldn't be giving you any advice on something that would do the opposite. Sounds like calling you was a waste of time. You shouldn't hang up. Why not? You've had nothing useful to offer to me. You know this is the second time you cheated on me. I forgave him the first time. That's why I gave him my kidney. That's how selfless I am. You know what, though? I think I want it back. Thomas, you need to hold still. You're getting blood everywhere. Please, you have to stop. Oh my god. Ma'am, you need to listen to me. If you really want your husband to survive this, you need to stop right now. Fine, the drill is off. For now. But seriously, why should I be wasting my time talking to you? Our 911 calls are recorded. If you hung up now, someone might think you intend to kill your husband. And if he dies during the surgery, it won't look good. You're bluffing. I'm an honest, hardworking American. My husband is the one here who needs to suffer. I won't kill him because I want him to suffer. How could he do this to me? Your conscience must know that it's wrong to torture him. Why call us at all? Are we just talking in circles? I told you I needed help to extract his kidney, the one he took from me. I don't think he deserves it anymore. Maybe I should use these other tools. More messy, but gets the job done. Becca, please, for the love of God, stop. Becca. Your name is Becca. Well, cat is out of the bag. Yes, Thomas and Becca. I suppose now you'll figure out who we are. Come hunting me down. Becca, I know you're angry, but Thomas has suffered enough. You should let him go. Not until I get that kidney. Do we have any idea where this call is coming from? This guy is on death's door. I see. You still there? I think Thomas is unconscious. Becca, where did you get your surgery? The hospital you work at. Why does it matter? Becca, please don't hurt Thomas any further. Can you describe his injuries so far? He's bleeding pretty bad out of his right abdomen, crying like a baby, too. God, he's so pathetic. Why did I ever love you? Becca, please, this has to stop. I can't take it anymore. How do you think I feel? Becca, we have units on the way. What? No, I don't want an ambulance. I'm refusing care. At this point, we are forced to intervene on behalf of your husband. How did you find us? How, with just so little information? Your previous surgery. Turns out that it is on file here at the hospital. I pulled records. I don't... No. 
You tricked me. Is Thomas still conscious? No. I think... I think he's lost a lot of blood. Becca, stay on the line. Help is on the way. I... I love him. Oh, God. What have I done? The caller, Becca Ramon, age 42, was arrested on August 3rd, 2023 for attempted homicide of her husband, Thomas Ramon, who is currently in critical care. According to her lawyer, however, Becca insists she was not attempting to harm her husband in any fashion and merely wanted to save money on hospital expenses and wanted to teach him a lesson. When asked why she was attempting this at home, she shrugged and said that she would use YouTube to learn. At this moment, it is unclear if Thomas will recover from her second home surgery attempt. The class was supposed to begin at 3.30, but it didn't, and it was already 13 minutes after that. A group text told us the issue was Miss Solomon had a flat tire and would likely be sending a sub so we wouldn't have to miss a whole day's worth of credits. The topic for discussion was CPR and first aid, and she had already spent the previous evening getting the dolls out and placing them on the tablets in front of us. So after another 19 minutes of waiting for the substitute, we did what any board students do and started to mess around with the gear. These things look so lifelike, my roommate Lisa said as she picked up one of the dolls and checked the mouth where we were supposed to breathe into the fake lungs. She even tried to blow into it. If successful, we would see the lungs inflate with air, and I joked, you're just looking for an excuse to get a kiss. Ew, are you kidding? Do you know how many people probably use this thing? She stuttered as she dropped it back on the table. I don't see the big deal. If it was a real person needing aid, you would do it in a heartbeat. Another student remarked. A few of the others nearby started to practice and Lisa sighed and said, Sure, I guess so. But why does it have to have such a creepy face? It's actually based on an infamous French woman that drowned near the rivers in Paris, one of the guys commented. Oh wow, that's kind of creepy, I admitted. I think I heard something like that. Wasn't she unidentifiable? Another student remarked. Yes, and the maker of the doll said that he didn't think a man would try to kiss another man, the first guy said. Why would they make a CPR doll based on something so creepy? I don't want to think about a dead chick from years ago, Lisa said, trying to hide her disgust. I shrugged and placed the protective cloth over the doll's mouth pushing fresh air in as I tested my own reflexes. Then finally, it was Lisa's turn, and she crossed her arms uncontrollably. Can I use a doll that no one else has put their slobber on? Don't be such a sissy, one guy muttered. I glanced toward the supply cabinet and saw that there was one more of the dolls up top and gestured for Lisa to grab it. Looks like nobody wanted that one, I teased as I looked at the old doll. My roommate grabbed a small stepladder and reached up to grab the doll, a bit surprised by its bizarre appearance. Unlike the other resuscitation dolls, this one has no face at all, just a place where someone could put their mouth against. It looked like it hadn't been used in forever. There's a note attached to the back, I observed. Lisa took it off and passed it to me, dusting off the mouthpiece and grabbing some sanitizer. This is the Breathless Bonnie, a medical assistance doll designed to simulate the experience of being out of breath. Let her help you take your breath away, I read as Lisa placed her lips on the old doll. She placed her hand against the doll's chest and took a deep breath, pushing in but getting nowhere. The doll didn't budge. It looked like she was struggling. It must be full of holes, a guy muttered. Lisa tried again. Suddenly, something was very wrong. All of us watched as Lisa's eyes widened in shock and she stumbled away from the doll clutching her throat. She fell back and hit her head against one of the other tables, gasping for breath as she continued to convulse. She continued to writhe and gasp for breath as she muttered something that sounded like it was in an ancient tongue and then became deathly still. All of us were too stunned for words, looking back at the breathless Bonnie doll as though it were cursed. The doll's body was wriggling, and something was pushing its way out of the hole of the faceless mask. It was a long, spindly, dark spider crawling its way out of the mouth of the doll. It moved along the body, its hind legs flared and its fangs gleaming, clearly agitated that Lisa had pushed so much air into its warm home. 
One of the guys squashed it with a chemistry book, an ooze of poison and blood smearing the table. We thought that was the resolution to the story, with a somber ending for my roommate who had unwittingly been poisoned by the venomous arachnid. When we told the tragic tale to our teacher though, she seemed especially troubled, insisting we show her where the doll was. We opened the cabinet and showed her the doll and she took it out and used a pocket knife to cut it open. Hundreds of spiders crawled out, many of which had thousands of eggs on their back. They skittered in every direction as all of us screamed in terror. Mrs. Solomon used a fire extinguisher on the whole scene to deter the poisonous spiders and rushed us out of the classroom. Needless to say, we took our class a different day after we mourned my friend. I didn't know what to even say to her family about what happened. It's haunted me for so long, I don't know what to do to recover. My mom said I should take therapy, and I drove up to the class today. But as I walked into the room, I saw that they had a resuscitation doll in the cabinet, and panic struck me. I don't care if it's a new model. I'm never going to try to do CPR again. I left immediately, my skin crawling as I thought of spiders wriggling out of my pores. The worst thing of all, I know Lisa suffered. I close my eyes at night and see her eyes looking at me for help. My dad is the best cook in the world. It could be something as simple as a bowl of porridge on a Sunday morning, which technically is just a bowl of slime if you think about it. When my father made it, however, it would be the most delicious breakfast dish in the world. He used a special kind of oats, or maybe he bought the regular kind and made them special by cutting them even more finely. He would toast them gently to help extract their flavor as he explained. Then he would boil them on low heat, taking his time as he prepared whatever would accompany the oatmeal or porridge. I'm never sure what the right name is, but I guess dad's dish would be porridge simply because it sounds more delicious than oatmeal. My favorite kind of porridge is by far the one he calls birthday cake. He adds in vanilla, colorful sprinkles, and other stuff I forgot. And I kid you not, it's the best breakfast in the world. I know it doesn't sound as crazily innovative as I make it out to be, I suppose it really isn't. Because I can use the exact same ingredients, trying to mimic his dish, and all I achieve is oat slime with some melted sprinkles. And not because I'm a bad cook. My mom, for example, is a really decent cook as well, but she can never reach the explosion of flavors in a dish quite the same as my dad. Nobody can. You are such a liar. He can't be the best in the world. Also, you've never even left town. How would you know, Chris? That's what my disbeliever of a classmate Toby said after I told everyone that I knew for a fact that my dad was the best cook in the world and that one day he would travel to every country in existence to battle the best chefs on earth. Back then when we were around 6 or 7 and I had realized that my dad being such a genius was definitely something I had to use to impress everyone in elementary school with and everyone believed me saying how cool that was as if my dad was a superhero except for that little know-it-all Toby of course. If something is the best you can tell, Toby, it's not that hard. And also, everyone who comes to visit us says so too. So what? Anyone that visits is from here too, so they don't know the world, stupid. Shut up, Toby! He was right. Nobody who lived here ever left town and came back, so they really wouldn't know. And we never got visitors from outside. I still didn't appreciate him talking back like that, though. Toby was the biggest know-it-all of our class, and I was probably the biggest liar. We would bicker about stuff all the time, for years, which might make it more surprising that we somehow ended up becoming best friends. But now, 10 years later, we are practically inseparable. And thanks to our friendship, Toby even had the luck of trying Dad's food from time to time. He still thinks saying that he is the best in the world is an exaggeration, but simply because he doesn't like to admit that I'm right. If you think that breakfast sounded good, you should see what my father comes up with for dinner. Well, not see, you should taste it, though I'm afraid that's impossible. Dad only makes dinner for us on very rare occasions. He works a lot, and when he comes home, he is usually too tired to cook. So we only get a home-cooked dinner by my father when we get visitors. Visitors that are from our town always, never from the outside. A lot of them I know quite well. It's usually the same group, a circle of friends of my parents. They have this dinner party once or twice a year and it's always at our house because everyone agrees that dad is the best cook of them all. They spend other events together as well at other homes or places, but when it comes to dinner, it's always our home. 
The dinner parties are very similar each time, for me at least. The guests arrive, I say hello, they ask me embarrassingly boring questions about life and school, and then I go back up to my room. I never join them for dinner. Instead, Dad brings me up a plate of food that I eat in my room, which I certainly prefer and am thankful for. Often, Toby comes over as well and we hang out in my room while my parents have their party downstairs. Dad was hesitant at first when I'd asked if Toby could come as well, but as we got older, he agreed it was fine as long as we didn't disturb the party. It kind of has become our tradition to play video games or listen to music in my room and eat Dad's amazing food while my parents practice their own tradition downstairs. These nights might sound a little mundane, but I used to love every part of them. They've been the same for years now, except for last night. Last night, things changed. As before every dinner party, Dad had been in the kitchen all day cooking while Mom decorated the dining room. I helped a little by chopping some vegetables and washing a few dishes in the afternoon. In the evening before the guests arrived, Toby rang our bell and the two of us went up to my room to play a new Nintendo game that Toby got as a gift from his uncle. He always gave Toby the best gifts, but he recently moved away from this town. We got so into the game that I didn't even realize how much time had passed until Dad knocked on the door. As soon as it opened, a sweet smell spread through my room. Hints of cardamom, nutmeg, and most prominently pumpkin. Whoa, that smells amazing, Mr. Milner. What did you make? Oh, just some mashed potatoes with pumpkin and greens. We both knew whatever he made was far more special than that. Even when he used the most boring ingredients, he knew how to mix spices so perfectly that they tasted otherworldly. But when Dad said those words, he didn't sound like he was trying to be humble. He seemed exhausted which was reflected through the empty look in his eyes. I got up to take the tray off his hand that had bowls of soup and two big plates full of the dishes my dad had been cooking all day. You all right, Dad? Oh, I'm fine, fine, just tired. Lots of cooking. Anyway, you know the rules, enjoy the food, but stay in your room, all right? We both nodded. After the door was closed again, I put the tray next to Toby and sat down. Your dad seemed weird, he said. I don't think he likes dinner parties very much. He has to work and everyone else just stuffs their faces. Or maybe he's not much of a swinger and your mom makes him, Toby grinned. For the hundredth time, my parents aren't swingers. Right, so why else are we not supposed to see what they're doing down there? Fuck off. Do you want to have dinner with all those old people? They're doing us a favor. Right, dinner, he grinned again. There was no part of me that believed that my parents were actually swingers, but Toby dared me to go look and I wasn't scared to walk around in my own house, so why wouldn't I go check? That's what I said to him. I tried to act cool, but some part of me was really afraid of whatever was going on down there. You see, these parties have become such a normal event in our lives that I sometimes forget or try to suppress how weird they really are. First of all, all the guests arrived totally overdressed in cocktail attire and too much makeup. Everyone seems far too excited with big smiles that appear forced. My mother is one of them and enjoys the night to the fullest. My dad is more reserved. One person always brings a big package. I've never seen what's in it though. That is usually all I see before going to my room. As I was tiptoeing down the stairs for the first time during a dinner party, my heart started beating so rapidly that I feared it might overshadow the classical music coming from our living room. Are you scared? A voice whispered in my ear as two hands grabbed onto my shoulder. I turned around to see the dark eyes of my friend and a massive grin on his face. You were meant to wait upstairs, dickhead, I whispered. I didn't want to miss the old guys going crazy. Old? Now that's a bit rude, don't you think? This time, the voice wasn't coming from Toby, but Miss Collis, a friend of my parents and dinner guest, who apparently just walked out of the bathroom. Oh, hi, um, sorry, Miss Callis. We just came down to... I started muttering. I don't know why I felt so nervous. This was my home, after all. But something about her big, widened eyes and the smeared lipstick around her mouth was extremely unnerving. Oh, don't apologize, dear. You two are quite grown up now. After all, I don't understand why your parents hired you in your room all night. I say you join us for dinner starting now. Come on. She grabbed first my hand, then Toby's. My friend and I exchanged a look of fear and curiosity. 
Look who I just found lurking in the halls, Miss Callis laughed loudly as we approached the living room. My mother had really outdone herself with the decorations. Big candles everywhere. Black tissues formed into pretty shapes. The chandelier above the table dimmed to a warm yellow. The only thing outshining the decoration was the food on the table. My eyes met the one of my mother who looked less angry than I imagined. Actually, everyone looked at us smiling. They didn't seem that annoyed that we were interrupting. And luckily, nobody was naked. Why don't we make some space for the kids? Let them enjoy the delicious meal with us for once. They look quite grown up to me, Miss Calvis said, and everyone started mumbling. Chris, Toby, do you want to sit with us? My mother asked in a nervous tone. I looked over at my father, whose face had turned completely pale. Just as before, he had a strange look in his eyes, but now I realized that it wasn't exhaustion. It was fear. No, uh, that's okay, um, we still have our food upstairs, I said. Nonsense, Miss Callis said. We have two empty seats right here. Tonight you will join us. End of discussion. It seemed way more normal than I'd have imagined at first, until they all started digging into the food as if they were starving animals, ripping off huge bites with their teeth, swallowing whole chunks of meat, and pouring it all down with red wine. No matter how wonderful I normally thought my father's cooking was, at the sight of this, I felt a bit appalled, especially when I saw that my mother ate just as disgustingly. My mother, who normally was so incredibly proper and perfect. Only my dad was not focused on the food. He was staring at me, and his eyes were saying, Run. Toby looked as if he found the whole event rather amusing and not as creepy or disgusting as it felt to me. I suppose he still thought they would start going wild soon, and in a way, they were, I suppose, just not the way we imagined. You're not eating, sweetie? Why's that? Your father's cooking is simply divine, Miss Cullen chuckled with her mouth full. She then proceeded to load a big spoon of shepherd's pie on my plate. I didn't answer, but quietly took a small bite out of it. It tasted amazing, of course, like everything Dad makes, but I didn't see this dish on the tray that he brought upstairs for us. When I looked at all the food in front of us, I noticed something. The food my father had been cooking today, the potatoes and pumpkin mash, the caramelized onions, and the roasted asparagus with sauce hollandaise. He had prepared them perfectly on the plates for Toby and me. But now I realized that none of the food he had cooked was on this table, and suddenly, I completely lost my appetite. My father was trying to warn us. The guests we have once or twice a year are friends of my parents, not by choice, I suppose. Their families have been part of this town for as long as it existed, and so have our ancestors. In a way, I suppose we are part of some kind of elite, although I never really felt like it, especially because of my dad, who was an incredibly down-to-earth person. I always thought the only reason he did these parties was for my mother, but as it turns out, there was another reason. Toby was the first one to leave. He asked to stay over, but I told him I wasn't feeling too well. The other guests stayed until late at night, having the best time you could imagine. My mother went to bed, exhausted with a full stomach, while Dad sat in the kitchen scrubbing the floor. The entire house was quiet and dark at this point. He thought I'd gone to bed as well. Monotonously, he scrubbed a stain on the wooden ground. Dad? I asked, my entire body trembling. He didn't look at me. You need to understand, Chris. We have been a part of this community for a very long time, he said, his eyes still glued to the floor. It's not a choice at this point. They tell us the date and we prepare. That's how we stay well and safe. Finally, he looked at me. We are lucky that they enjoy my cooking skills, because that way we stay needed. I just wish your mother wouldn't enjoy it so much as well. Once or twice a year, we have a dinner party at our house. My father spends all day preparing food that only me and sometimes my friend Toby eat. As the guests arrive, however, they bring one other special ingredient. Once or twice a year, we have a dinner party at our house. Coincidentally, once or twice a year, somebody moves away from this town, and they never come back. Luckily, I'm a pretty decent liar, because I have no clue how I would ever be able to explain to Toby that he devoured his uncle for dinner last night. When I was a little boy, my fondest summer memories were spending time in the North Woods at my Uncle Howard's. He had this rustic old cabin that was surrounded on all sides by nothing but pure nature. The local hunters called it Howard's Hideout, 
Every time my brother John and I would visit, a new adventure would await us. But as you grow up, those things fade, and you find yourself focusing on the adventures of adulthood. They aren't nearly as fun, and you can't just wiggle your nose and change the story. I wish I could change this story, but this isn't about me. It's about my uncle and the legacy he left behind. Howard died last June from a massive heart attack. I remember John called me at work to tell me the news. He knew I was always especially close to our uncle. A rush of memories flooded over me after I got off the phone, fishing down at the creek, setting snares along the property line, listening to old westerns as he popped a bag of kettle corn over the open stove. What stuck out the most was the ghost stories Uncle Howard would tell. That evening, John and I went out for drinks, and I asked him what his favorite campfire story Howard told us was. Gee, bro, I don't know. He told us a lot of crazy things, he said with a laugh. I prodded him for a moment longer, and finally he gave in and said, That one about the bear. I sat there and drank my own whiskey, remembering the story quite well. Uncle Howard had a way of making the monsters extra vivid in his stories, and none of them were more frightening than the entity that John recalled. According to our uncle, the creature was about as large as a seven-foot-tall man with massive claws that could tear a person into twelve pieces all at once. Papa Bear is what he called it. Apparently, despite being so fearsomely large, Papa Bear was actually not all that dangerous, or so Howard reassured us. He's a protector of these woods. Keeps the good in and the bad out. That's why you boys are safe here. Papa Bear is watching out for us, he said. Apparently, Papa Bear decided who was and wasn't welcome in the woods and eliminated any threats to keep the forest secure and magical. Though I knew that somehow John and I were spared, I recalled every detail of what happened to its victims. Those who trespassed were not simply killed. He made sure to tell us that the victims became slaves to the abomination, tasked to clean the forest that they had defiled. I knew even as a young boy, Uncle Howard was trying to make sure we kept nature clean, but still, it scared the shit out of me. Especially at night, when the wind would whistle through the old cabin, and it would make everything sound so loud, like a groaning noise or a wailing. I remember vividly hiding under the covers one night when the sounds went on for hours, I didn't even get up to go to the bathroom and instead peed on myself just to stay safe. Who do you think will get the cabin? John asked me, bringing my mind back to the present. I had to admit I really didn't know, considering that my uncle and aunt had divorced quite some time ago. It seems a shame to just let it sit out there, I said. Later that same week, I spoke with his second ex-wife, Denise, on the phone. Our aunt, Rena, died around the time when I went to college. Denise admitted she didn't really have any idea about the last will and testament or if it even included anything about the cabin, but promised she would look into it. That Saturday, my dad and I went to hear the reading of the will. A few of our other relatives I hadn't seen in a while were there. I even saw Howard's estranged son, Walker, show up. Wasn't he in prison? My dad whispered to me when he walked in. You're the cop, not me, I said back as Walker sat down a few rows ahead of us. You know what? I think I remember now. It was just a misdemeanor on illegal possession, but they always thought he might have been involved in the Cooper case. My dad whispered back. If you have lived around this area long enough, then you know what my dad was talking about. For those of you who don't, about six years back, a family went missing on the north stretch of the interstate near the state line. The investigation into their disappearance revealed that they had been planning a fishing trip for the family into the woods, husband and wife and two girls. Shannon, the oldest girl, was the only body they ever found around a year later. Apparently, she had somehow survived that long out in the woods and was trying desperately to reach civilization, but ended up running into a meth lab. The same meth lab that Walker had been busted a few months after her body was found there. I had never read the full report, but it struck me as odd that the timing of the two events were so close together. A few moments after my dad made this comment, the cabin was mentioned in the will, and to my shock and dismay, it was Walker that managed to get the property. I followed him outside after the reading was finished and found him leaned against the building smoking. He gave me a lopsided smile. Brian, it's been a while, he said as he offered me a smoke. I'm clean now, Walker. Pretty crazy about your dad, huh? I told him. He nodded, not saying much. 
I knew that he had always been jealous of John and I. Uncle Howard had always been much more of a father to us than him, and I was positive that it always rubbed him the wrong way. So, what you need, Brian? I know you didn't come out here just to chew chud with me, he said. You going to the funeral tomorrow? I asked. Gotta pay respects to the old man, Walker answered. I know it's probably an odd request, but I was hoping maybe I could handle the distribution of his remains, I said. His ashes? He asked with a nervous laugh. I was just thinking about his cabin out there and, and how much he loved it, I explained as I tried not to tear up. I knew Walker wouldn't understand, but I was surprised when he agreed to let me have the canister. You can fling them all up and down the country for all I care, he said as he tossed his burnt cig down. I talked with John about my intentions to head to the cabin that next weekend, and my brother suggested we make a camping trip out of it, a final way to say goodbye to Uncle Howard. We drove up that Saturday morning in the late June heat. We took John's pickup truck, and I remember having to keep myself cool by using a wet rag and some ice because he didn't have any AC. By the time we had arrived, I was sweating so bad, I decided to head down to the creek for a swim. You ain't getting out of helping me get this shit inside, my brother told me. Even though we both felt like we were going to have a heat stroke, I helped him carry our luggage inside and set it down on the couch. It still looks like it's still in good condition, John said. I had to admit, I was impressed with the cleanliness of the cabin, and I wondered immediately how long it had been since Howard had been here. He really loved this place, I realized. We looked around at some of the hunting trophies that he had hanging on the wall, and I remembered Howard teaching me how to skin small birds to prepare them for the stuffing process. Remember that all things on this earth are created to serve men, boy. You don't want to hurt God's creation, and you want to respect life, Howard told me. I saw one of the geese I helped to preserve and reached up to touch the feathers. It was amazing how after all these years, it still seemed in perfect condition. The woods made everything feel even more inviting, like we were taking a trip back in time and experiencing everything for the first time. We followed the West Trail, listening to the gentle singing birds and looking at some of the old snares that Howard still had set up. Once the trail came to an end, we relied on memory alone to reach the creek. The water looked as clear as it had when we were kids. I didn't take a moment to hesitate and toss my shoes off and let my feet relax on the right side of the stream. John took off his shirt and jumped into the deeper portion of the creek, howling excitedly. It felt so good to be here. We stayed down at the creek for about an hour and then John suggested we do a little bit of hunting. Back at the cabin, I walked down to the basement to find any of our uncle's guns. The basement was in a bit more disrepair than upstairs, but I recalled that Howard kind of used it as a spare closet, storing all his junk there. Near the back of the room, I found a small lot cache where he kept all his rifles and then rummaged through the other drawers nearby for the key. A gentle sound like a whisper seemed to slowly creep into the room, and it made me pause in what I was doing. Then, the noise grew louder. It sounded like the noise as we heard when we were younger. A gentle, muffling wail. I took the keys and grabbed a few guns, leaving the basement behind and feeling a little unsettled. As we walked out towards the woods, I told John about it. We're barely here for a few hours and you're already hearing things? Man, I can't wait for tonight, he joked. I laughed it off as nerves or just my imagination. We followed the other trail behind the cabin up toward the mountains. I brought our uncle's ashes along, remembering one of his favorite spots was along this path. It was a scenic overlook of the forest itself and nearby lake. Uncle Howard usually wouldn't let us come up there as kids because of the precipitous slopes. There was one time, though, that he did whenever we had accidentally shot a deer in the wrong spot and it was unfit for eating. I thought we were going up the slope to bury it up. Howard showed me a pit where other hunters also disposed of carcasses. This keeps the bears happy, he explained. I found the pit after a little trial and error and decided this would be a perfect spot to release Howard's ashes. I held a handkerchief over my mouth and opened the canister, watching as the wind carried them away. Then my attention was drawn toward the pit itself, and I noticed something out of the ordinary. It took me a minute to realize what it was. Holy shit! I shouted out as I took a few steps back from the ledge. John was there in a second, and I wordlessly pointed down the slope to where the littered remains of a few bones were at, along with a human skull. Jesus, John said. He decided to climb down and examine the bones. A few minutes later, he was back up on the slope with me looking concerned. 
we should probably call Dad. I can't tell for sure if that was an accident or something much worse, John explained. Neither of us said anything as we returned to the cabin. I almost felt like we were being watched. But once we got there, I decided I wasn't going to let it ruin the weekend. I searched through Howard's freezer and found some thawed deer meat at the top to cook. John was walking around the cabin, trying to get reception on his phone, and then finally admitted, This is what I get for switching to T-Mobile. I checked mine and noted I had a few bars, so I passed it to him and he walked outside to make the call. I walked to the back of the cabin where the propane stove was at and turned on the gas to get everything heated and paused as I listened to the soft whistle of the ignition light coming on. Beneath that noise, I was certain I was hearing the same wails I heard earlier, and a repetitive, thudding noise. It made me feel very uncomfortable as I cooked and tried to ignore the sound. When John came back in, he told me Dad would be there first thing in the morning to examine the body. The noises had stopped for the moment, but I was becoming more convinced than ever that the cabin was actually haunted. That evening, as the sun went down, John searched through the second-story closets for blankets, and we both agreed to sleep in the living room. If this place really is haunted, we'll know tonight, won't we? He said. I stayed awake until almost one in the morning, listening for anything. Then, at last, the noises returned. It sounded like gentle footsteps. Then there were voices. I couldn't make out what they were saying, but I instantly woke up John. He switched on the lights in the living room and listened as well. The noises were growing louder. What the hell? John said as he felt something under him, but neither of us could see anything on the floor. Then I felt it too, like a low vibration. Nervously, we moved to the second floor. The noises became more subdued and somehow we found a way to get sleep. In the morning, Dad got there and we guided him to the ridge. Should we tell him about the other thing? I asked John as we trekked up the mountainside. Tell me what? Dad asked. He always had excellent hearing. This is probably going to sound crazy, but Uncle Howard's place, it's got ghosts, John answered. Dad looked at us both skeptically, but we insisted he come back to the cabin and see for himself. We all headed inside, and John and I tried our best to explain what we heard. It felt like something was moving around under our feet, John said. Dad was trying to not roll his eyes. Then the noises returned, soft and subdued like before. He pulled out his firearm and looked about, muttering, what sort of prank is this? It's for real, Dad, I said as we walked around the cabin, listening to the strange moaning noises. Dad made his way toward the stairs, walking carefully to the basement. The thudding got louder as we looked around the basement, and then Dad gestured for all of us to be quiet and still. I was too scared to move a muscle. Then he walked toward Howard's old tool cabinet and started to push it aside. I watched silently as he revealed a large wooden door hidden behind it with a metal lock. The noises were coming from the other side. Dad pointed his weapon at the lock and shot it off without hesitation, and all of us stood there in fear as the door creaked open. A thin, skeletal woman collapsed onto the floor in front of us. Dad rushed over to help her, quickly glancing at the bruises on her legs and arms like she had been chained. Don't just stand there! Call 911! Dad shouted to us. John took out his phone immediately as I took a few steps toward the door. There was a dark tunnel beyond that curved into the solid earth, and I found myself stepping forward to see what the darkness hid. As it curved around, I found myself standing directly under the living room in a wide open den, where more chains were latched to the ground as though meant for animals. The place reeked of the smell of urine and feces. I held my hand over my mouth as I looked across the room to see the decaying corpses of at least two other women, and at last, I understood. John followed me down there and then found himself running and vomiting. I found a large cabinet on the west side of the dungeon filled with photographs. I cannot begin to describe the things that Howard made them do while they were trapped down here. The woman that Dad rescued turned out to be the youngest of the Coopers that had gone missing six years ago. She did not live for another two days due to bladder failure. It's been almost ten months now since I went to the cabin. I tried not to think about the horrors I found there, but lately they've consumed my every thought. And John? He handled it the worst. Once he realized the true depth of our uncle's depravity, all those times we spent summer there, giggling when we listened to the low wails that whispered their way through his cabin, the guilt made him take his life. I've returned to the cabin now with one singular mission. I doused the entire first floor with gasoline and then activated the stove on a low setting. I sat out in the pickup truck and watched as it burned. 
It sounded like the cabin was screaming as it fell apart into shambles, like it was in pain. But the pain I feel will always be greater. Nine one one, what's your emergency? Hello? Are you there? I can't be loud. Someone is watching me. Can you tell me where you are right now? I'm not sure. Some kind of hotel. I woke up here about 30 minutes ago. Oh god, I think they're coming into the bathroom. Hold on. Hello? Ma'am, are you there? I'm going to remain on the line, ma'am. Sorry. False alarm. That was just this stupid dog. This is crazy. How long will I have to hide here? Why are you hiding? What's going on? Okay, I'm trying to piece it together. I woke up in this hotel about 30 minutes ago. At first, I thought maybe it was a one-night stand. Maybe I had a little too much to drink. Then I saw there were marks on my wrists and ankle, like from shackles placed against my skin too tight. You believe you've been kidnapped? Yes, and I think the person that did it is still here in the hotel room, hiding and watching my reaction. Why do you say that? When I was checking out the room, trying to get a sense of where I'm at, I heard this breathing, like someone was right against my neck. I looked around to find the source and I saw these two eyes right in the closet. I wasn't gonna go investigate, so I ran into the bathroom instead. Using the cell phone I found in here to call you. Can you still see the person you think is watching you? Hold on, I will check. Please don't put yourself in too much danger. Yes, they are still across the room. The closet they are hiding in looks pretty small, but I can see their eyes staring at me. God, they look disgusting. Why would you describe them that way? It's like they're covered in mud or possibly human feces. It's this brown and green goop. I saw it littered across the carpet too when I ran to the bathroom. I think I should lock the door. Hold on, ma'am. Can you try to see if there's anything in the room that can help identify where you're at? I'm not going out there. Can't you just pinpoint the call? It may take some time. From the data I've gathered so far, the cell phone you are using appears to be a burner, so finding a nearby cell tower could take even longer. What should I do? Am I gonna die here? No one is going to hurt you as long as you remain hidden. We will work this out together. I'm so scared. I think that I'm going to have a heart attack. This stupid dog won't stop barking. Feels like my heart is beating out of my chest. Try to focus on something else. Tell me a little about yourself. Now we're doing small talk. The pervert is still watching me. I don't hear them breathing anymore, but I can still see them. It will help pass the time while I attempt to triangulate your call. Lucy. It's Lucy Furness. I'm 19. I was just trying to have a good time tonight. My god, that guy is still staring at me. Was this his dog? Lucy, do you think you can get close enough to the man to see if he might still be alive? What do you mean? I can see him staring at me, covered in his own filth. It's disgusting. Oh my god, I feel so sick. It's entirely possible the reason he is not moving is something happened to him. You mean I'm staring at a corpse? Can you please see if he makes any movements? This is so disturbing. I'm not trying to get closer. Oh my god, I think I know him. He was my date. Oh god, I think he's dead. Did I just watch him die? Lucy, I believe we are close to pinpointing your call. I'm vomiting. Something feels wrong with my stomach. Oh god, I think I'm having a heart attack. Lucy, stay with me. I can't stand. Oh god, the room is spinning. My chest. Lucy. Lucy. Oh god. We are remaining on the line to ensure this call can be traced. Hold on, Lucy. Oh man, the girl is dead now too. We gave too much. Jesus, the dog is licking up the vomit. This is disgusting. We need to clean this up. How are we going to do that? This looks bad. This is your fault. She called 911. She's been on the phone this whole time. I would recommend you remain where you are. Police are already on their way. We'll be long gone. The call came from a downtown hotel in Boston, Massachusetts. The caller, Lucy Vernez, was 19 and taken by two Latino men who were involved in human trafficking on the night of July 15, 2023. An autopsy revealed that they gave her heavy drugs to sedate and capture her three hours before she woke up in the hotel. 
Investigators believe that the two men were planning to use Lucy as a drug mule alongside the second victim, an unidentified male that was accompanying her. This male had an unexpected reaction to the drugs that they gave him, resulting in him attacking the two men and defecating on himself and the hotel room. The drugs passed through his body at such a speed that it eventually resulted in his death. The two men stuffed his body in a closet as he struggled to breathe and left to find supplies to clean up, not realizing Lucy would wake up. Lucy used the male victim's phone to call 911. The emergency dispatcher eventually found the two bodies thanks to keeping the phone on during Lucy's own violent reaction. At the time, Lucy believed that the man in her closet was her attacker, and as a result, her date for the night died suffocating on the filth that covered his body. Lucy would later seek therapy for the ordeal she witnessed that night. The two men managed to escape before authorities arrived. Fibers in the room reveal that a Boston Terrier was also in the room. Authorities are hoping to use this to track down the two men. The woman entered my office uninvited. Maggie was sick at home or she would have sent her on her way. But then again, I got the feeling even Maggie couldn't have refused this woman. She had a look of determination in her icy blue eyes. Her short ash blonde hair was swept up to the side stylishly and she carried an oversized bag with her. Immediately I recognized what she was. I'd seen enough of her kind in my time a pharmaceutical rep. Dr. Balm, she said, reaching out her hand. I took it and gave it a polite shake. I'm Lisa from Rendex Pharmaceuticals. We've been trying to reach you by telephone, but never quite managed to connect. Probably because my secretary was doing her job, I thought to myself. She always screened those sorts of calls. I had no interest in being a shill for a drug company. My apologies, I said. What can I do for you? She set her large black bag on the reception counter next to where we were standing and began to pull out sample packets and brochures. The phone began to ring loudly at the desk. I wanted to answer it, but the woman had already begun her pitch. Well, that's just it, Dr. Baum. It's not about what you can do for us, but what we can do for your patients. Here we go, I thought. She opened up a brochure and began to show me details from inside its glossy pages. Speaking persuasively enough that I listened instead of immediately sending her on her way, as I usually did, she was an extremely good saleswoman. Our newest drug, Similatrex, has just been accepted for approval by the FDA. It's an absolute game changer, effective for depression, anxiety, even thoughts of self-harm can be allayed by its formula. This is the next generation we're talking about. This drug, by itself, is going to completely replace SSRIs and benzos in the next few years. All the benefits without the harmful side effects and dependencies. Not only that, but instead of taking months to begin working as is the case with most SSRIs, Similatrex begins its effects almost immediately. Those are some very bold claims. So you can see why we've been trying so hard to reach you, to talk to you about it, she said with an undeterred smile. I picked up one of the sample boxes and examined it. The packaging looked like any other drug, a pale purple color with yellow butterflies all over it. The company's brand name stamped upon it in bold letters. Rendex Pharmaceuticals? How come I've never heard of you guys? We're a German company, new to North America, but we're going to make a big splash in the Western markets. I'd tell you to start investing now, but I'm sure you don't play the stock market. No, I don't, and I don't usually speak to pharmaceutical reps either, if I'm being entirely honest. But if even half your claims are true, they're all true, she replied, her teeth fixed firmly in the unstoppable grin. Leave the sample packets. I'll do some research and think about it. How's that? She stuck out her hand for another shake and I took it reluctantly. That's all I can ask for, doctor. I won't take up any more of your time. I'm sure you're very busy. Packing up her bag, she thanked me and left, the broad smile still plastered on her face. It was disarming and I couldn't help but smile back at her as she walked out saying goodbye. I vowed to do some research on my own before giving out the sample packages to anyone, so that night I took a box home with a brochure and decided I would do a few hours of reading, trying to find out what exactly the benefits and side effects of similar treks would be. Don't ask what got into my head, why I ended up taking the pills, especially when I didn't even know the first thing about the company or the product. I wouldn't say I'm depressed, per se, but I've slipped into a bit of a rut since my father died a couple years back. Every day feels the same. The old pleasures of life don't bring the same enjoyment. People who know me very well say I don't laugh or joke around as much as I used to. I wasn't pining for happiness, I was just curious. 
Still, I should have known better than to try an untested drug given to me by some stranger. Websites can be faked. They can be easily thrown up and plastered with images and information that is utterly false and misleading. It takes time for those sorts of websites to get taken down, and all it took was a visit to three or four of those fake websites provided by the pharmaceutical rep conjured up to look real and I was impressed. On the Smile the Trex company website was a promotional video. I remember that much, but I don't remember what happened in it or why I felt so persuaded after watching it, but suddenly I wanted to try the drug for myself to feel its amazing benefits. For some reason I'll never understand, I took out the sample packet right after watching the video on the Smilotrex company website. I examined the little round pill and saw there was a symbol etched on it that looked druidic and evil. Swallowing the pill dry, I couldn't help but wonder why I had done that. My phone began to ring and I picked it up to hear Maggie, my secretary, on the other end. I blinked my eyes and saw it was morning outside and yet I had no memory of falling asleep or of anything after taking the pill. Hello, Dr. Baum. Oh, hi, Maggie, I said, smiling wide at the sound of her voice. How are you feeling? I hope you're doing a bit better. I'm feeling much better, actually. I'll be back in today. That's great news. This place isn't the same without you. She paused. Are you okay, Dr. Baum? You sound different. I'm great, Maggie. Actually, I feel better than ever. I had the best night's sleep of my life last night. I don't remember a thing. Oh. Okay, I guess that's good. Well, I'll see you at the clinic in an hour or so. Sounds perfect. Thanks, Maggie. She hung up and I got out of bed to get myself ready for work. There was a full slate of appointments booked for the morning, but the afternoon was mostly left open for walk-ins and emergencies. It would be nice to have Maggie back in, since she took a bit of the weight off my shoulders. Her job was to check patients in, take their weights and vital signs, as well as faxing paperwork and answering phones. It was hard to do it all by myself, especially since our fax machine was about a decade old and malfunctioned regularly. Maggie knew how to tame the ancient beast though. As I brushed my teeth, I couldn't help but think how long it had been since I had felt so good. Sure, the lapse in memory was slightly alarming, but as I looked at my face in the mirror, I couldn't help but grin wider, thinking about how nice it felt just to be alive. My skin was tingling with anticipation for the day and for the things it held in store. It felt like wonderful little bugs crawling all over me, burrowing into my flesh. How delightful. When I arrived at work, my cheeks were beginning to hurt from smiling so much. It was like I couldn't stop. No, not that. Really, I didn't want to. The world was just so bright and blue and wonderful. It made me want to laugh with joy. And so I did. Then after that, I began to giggle. As I entered my office and said good morning to Maggie, I broke into a titter, then a full-blown belly laugh. What's so funny, Dr. Baum? She asked nervously. I couldn't even answer her. I just went into my office and hung up my coat, then sat down in front of my computer, slapping my knee and guffawing. Tears were streaming down my face as I continued chuckling all the way up until my first appointment. The patient could be heard coming into the waiting room, and I held my cheeks to my mouth like a child in church to keep the laughter in. I listened as Maggie checked the man in and took his weight on the old rickety scale. As she brought him into the exam room, I tried to suppress my laughter, which was self-sustaining at this point. No matter how much I tried to think of sad things to stop myself from giggling, it continued. I was vaguely beginning to get worried that I couldn't stop. Finally, I managed to focus and get it under control, breathing deeply. I stood up and started walking into the room where the patient was waiting for me. I pushed open the door and entered, saying good morning to the man who was sitting on the steel examination table, wearing nothing but his underwear. He was very, very hairy. Sitting down, I looked at the laptop screen and brought up his appointment information. Patient name, Harold Harry Ball. Age, 69. I thought about this for a moment before bursting into laughter again. The man held his arms over his naked chest as it flushed red to match his face. For a few moments, he looked embarrassed, but then that expression changed to one of worry. Dr. Baum, are you alright? For some reason, I couldn't stop laughing to answer him. He walked out of the appointment and said he wouldn't come back, that there was something wrong with me. The rest of the day, I couldn't stop laughing, even after Maggie left. She quit after I refused to speak with her rationally, saying that when I got my wits together, I should call her to talk and to apologize. I shut down the office, and for the rest of the week, the laughter continued. Then for week after week after that until I couldn't even leave my bedroom, the pain in my diaphragm was so excruciating, the growing wounds on my face so terrifying to passerby. 
It got worse and worse. Have you ever gotten the giggles so bad that your face starts to hurt? Imagine getting the giggles for a month, being unable to stop laughing for an entire four week period, and it still isn't letting up. I still can't stop smiling no matter how hard I try. My face hurts so badly I want to scream, but I can't do anything but continue chuckling like a broken Elmo toy. They had to admit me to a hospital as my face began to split and crack around my mouth and eyes, bleeding wounds growing from the laugh lines which turned into weeping sores. Who knows when this will stop? When it will finally be out of my system is anyone's guess. The company's videos certainly aren't any help. Now that they've been wiped from the internet, vanished as if they never even existed. I just hope that I can be free of this toxic shit one day soon. So let this be a warning to any doctors out there. If you see Lisa from Rindex Pharmaceuticals enter your office, don't take the sample boxes, don't watch the videos, or read the brochures. Who knows what page or what image it is that will flip the switch in your mind and make you want to take the little pill she offers, grinning and promising happiness. I guarantee you, it isn't worth it. <laughs> <laughs>
This man wasn't big. He looked rail thin and yet he already ate more than what myself and my brother did in two minutes after sitting down. We should have paid our bill and left, but we sat in our seats transfixed at the sight before us. We no longer tried to hide staring at this man eating. Another four plates set aside and the servers were sweating. They were acting as if a wild animal came inside but needed to act professional serving it. The music that played over some sort of hidden system cut out letting us hear the sounds of his cutlery against his plates and faintly a dishwasher running somewhere in the kitchen. Oddly enough, the man wasn't making any disgusting chewing sounds. Well, until he got to the shrimp plate. The restaurant served whole shrimp with the head still attached. I've never tried eating them before. The man didn't take the heads off, he just shoved the whole thing in his mouth and I could hear the shells crunching as he chewed. I already lost track of how much food he'd already eaten. I caught my brother's eyes again and he mouthed the silent, what the f***? His face pale and I assume my own expression was the same look of horror. The strange man got to a place of some sweet and sour short ribs. They honestly were my favorite things served at the restaurant and I tensed up waiting to see if he ate them the same way he ate the shrimp. Shells were one thing, but bones? There was no way he was going to eat the bones. We both stared, mouths open as he ate through the pile with no issue at all, bones and all. The sound of his teeth cracking against the ribs, the only thing echoing inside the restaurant. This was insane. There was no way someone could eat like this. We had a chance to just leave. I doubted the owners would care if we fled without paying our bill by then. There was no way to figure out how much he ate with all the empty plates being taken away. We lost track of time, but I think it wasn't very long. This man ate more than what some people did in six months in under an hour. Finally, all the plates were removed and replaced by clean, empty ones covering his table. He turned his head to meet our gazes. I nearly screamed, having the set of bright eyes on us. We both froze, unable to move when he stood up, adjusting his vest. Even after eating so much, he didn't make a mess. No drips of sauce on his vest or at the corners of his mouth. He took the few steps to come over to our table, a smile on his face that made my body want to fold into itself. He stopped and placed a hand on the back of my chair, trying to look as friendly as possible. I wanted to scream. I looked up at my brother, silently begging him to do something. His hand went to his butter knife, gripping it so tightly that his knuckles turned white. If this man tried anything to his little sister, he might attack him. Thank God for older brothers. I am sorry you both needed to witness all of that. It must have been unnerving for you. But this restaurant had a wonderful dessert prepared for me tonight, and I needed to come in right away. The stranger spoke, his voice sweet and with the hint of a southern accent. Y you ate the bones? I choked out, unable to say anything else. Oh yes, I am able to digest things like that. One should always clean their plates. It's an insult to the chefs and the food otherwise. He said, and his eyes fell on our plates. We still had a few things left over. I started to sweat, my chest getting tight waiting for him to do something. My mind going crazy with thoughts of what the hell this man really was and what he would do to us for not finishing our meals. But I suppose a few pieces left behind isn't the end of the world. After all, you did see something a bit strange. It's understandable to not finish your dinner with your stomach upset. I'll pay for your meals as an apology. I do know that my eating habits are a bit different from your own. He said, his friendly tone never wavering. I sighed and my brother relaxed his grip on the knife. I wanted to leave and nearly did so when I saw his face twist into horror. He saw something before I did and I heard a sound of muffled screaming. I tensed again, praying that if I didn't move nothing would happen. The sound got closer, and out of the corner of my eyes, I saw the servers dragging a bound man through the empty dining room. He struggled harder when he got closer to the table of empty plates. His pleas for help hidden under the cloth stuffed in his mouth and wrapped around his head. Oh, there's my special dessert now. This one was found trying to climb into a window of a child in the dead of night. It seems that wasn't the first time he's done so, just the first time he was caught. My dinner threatened to come back up hearing those words. I let myself watch the servers place the struggling bound men on the table and on the plates. He broke a few as they forced him still. 
He kicked and thrashed, causing some of the broken shards to cut his clothing. The stranger didn't mind. He turned from our table to go back to his with a new meal. I only stayed long enough to watch the stranger's mouth literally unhinge from his jaw. I knew he wouldn't eat his dessert as neat and proper as he did with his dinner. I grabbed my brother by the wrist and dragged him out of that place, letting out a small scream when I heard the first sounds of the stranger biting down. We got into his car and got the hell out of there, neither of us speaking. We didn't even notice my brother accidentally stole the butter knife until we got back home. We threw it out, not wanting the thing in the house. It took hours for either of us to finally speak to each other. Do you want to go to the movies instead of dinner for your birthday next year? My brother asked in a shaking voice. I nodded, agreeing with him. It sucks that I could never eat at that restaurant again. I really like their sweet and sour short ribs.